welcome back to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Angie and I'm a chemist who loves makeup. So today we're going to be talking all about mica and I thought to bring up mica and discuss it because it recently came up in Jaclyn Hill's launch video where she specifically mentioned mica as one of the ingredients in her highlighter collection and there was a lot of talk about it on the internet because there is some ethical concerns about mica potentially where it could be sourced from. It's going to be one point we hit on as well as what it is, why it's in our products, is it in any other industries, all that interesting to you. We are going to get into that right now. So first let's talk about what is mica. So mica is a variety of aluminum silicate materials and we are not going to get into the deep deep chemistry of these basically these are sheet structured materials so mica can be found in a lot of different types of like rock structures geological formations and it is very it's a very abundant material it can be produced synthetically and but if you see the INCI name for mica then that is a naturally occurring source. The INCI is what cosmetic companies are supposed to use to list their ingredients. That's what they're supposed to reference off of. So there's like a set standard of ingredient listings. And if it is synthetic, it will most likely to be seen as synthetic fluoroflogopite. I am probably, that is one of those ones that I'm just gonna always butcher, but I will put it up here for you to see. So there are two main types. There is sheet mica, which is mined in sheets, or there is flake mica, also referred to as scrap mica, which is basically the scraps of this mica. And for different industries, the flake mica can then be further ground down to yield a powder-like material. And we know that mica is common in a very, very large portion of color cosmetic products, but it is also used in other industries. I believe the cosmetic industry only uses, I believe less than 20% was the figure I saw. So that means there are other industries using the rest of that. The electronics industry will use the sheet mica. It's really good for insulation, for example, so it can be used in like hair dryers all the way up to transformers of it. You will also find it in paint. It is what gives it that kind of a sparkling look. I'm sure you've seen that before. And one of those type of paints is car paints, but also for cars, it can be used for plastic, such as the bumper, other portions of cars, which a lot of them are made out of plastic now. Oil, it's an additive in the drilling mud and it serves as a lubricant and a sealant. It can be used in plastics, for instance, that give to give the plastic that pearlescent effect. And in construction, because it's really good filler material. So there's a lot of other industries that use mica. It is not just the cosmetics industry. In the cosmetic industry, we can see it as a filler ingredient or a main component of eyeshadow powders. It's in liquid foundations. It's in a lot of color cosmetics. Part of the reason is because it can yield that pearlescent effect depending on the particle size of the mica. So why is there controversy over this? So the hot spot for where mica produced is in India. And what I'm about to tell you is that also it's thought to occur in other countries where mica is mined, but predominantly the focus seems to be on India. And this is because of the use of child labor, unsafe conditions, illegal mine operations, a lot of problems going on. And this happens because these areas are usually impoverished, they're remote, there's not a lot of access to education. And this is the area's source of being able to support itself. So these children are in conditions where they are working long days, they are not getting paid a lot. Since these mines are not really regulated, the conditions are not safe, a lot of children have died in them. So this is why this is such a big deal. So what happened was once the USSR collapsed, there was basically a micro recession. The government started to kind of not really regulate them as much. And also in 1980 in India, the Forest Conservation Act was introduced. So because in order to preserve these forests, it basically banned legal mining because a lot of these mines are found within these forests. And so government had no oversight over what was happening in these mines. Plus a lot of these areas are very, very remote, like we mentioned earlier. So obviously this is very alarming. It is very concerning that we are using products that could cause these kind of problems to other people. So should we boycott mica in order to stop this from happening? It's not really as black and white as that. Part of the problem is, is like I said, these are very, 
isolated areas. They don't have the agricultural conditions to be able to farm on their own. There's not a lot of access to education. These are very rural areas and this is their one source. So by leaving these areas and by not and by not buying from this, it actually could be hurting these communities. If these communities were to stop mining, they wouldn't have anything else to rely on to support themselves. So that's what kind of makes it hard, it's not really as black and white. And like I said earlier, the combination of other industries do use the vast majority of mica, so it's not just as simple as avoiding mica altogether. That being said, there was a group founded in officially in 2017, but they kind of organized in 2016, and this is a responsible mica initiative. So their whole goal is to have a holistic approach to solving the mica problem. So basically they're trying to help solve the problems of mica mining in these regions. Their strategy is to have their members track where their mica is coming from, have it be traceable in their supply chain, and secondly is to help empower these villages, help the children get educated, give them the resources they need for these communities to thrive. And thirdly is to try to work with the government in order to provide the legal framework so that way these workers are protected, these the conditions are adequate, pay is adequate. So there are a lot of companies that have chosen to be part of this initiative. Most of them seem to be beauty companies. Don't really see a lot of outside of the beauty industry on there, but some of them are Estee Lauder, L'Oreal, Cody, Burt's Bees, LVMH, which owns, which is part of the Kendo family, the Sephora collection. So there are a lot of big players on there, which is really, really good to see. So it's important to note that the RMI is not a certification body. They are not going out there and checking on their members to make sure that they are upholding these standards. These members, when they join, are committing to follow these standards, but they are not being checked on by RMI. But by being in this group, I would imagine this would give these companies all the resources they need in order to make the ethical decisions to source their mica correctly. So the alternative, like we said, would be just not using mica, using this synthetic mica. Some companies will choose not to use mica altogether. These aren't very many. One of them is Lush. So instead now they use that synthetic version. I imagine it must be more expensive. So they now use that instead of sourcing mica. At one point they were able to track it within their supply chain, but then they switched suppliers or something like that and the trail got kind of murky and they couldn't guarantee where their mica was being sourced from. So they chose to not use it altogether. So in the article that I read in Marie Claire, they said they don't buy a lot of mica, so that's why they chose to make that decision. But they do believe that the big players, if they can, should stay in there and try to help improve the region because they have the resources to do that. This is where it may be harder for smaller companies who might run into the same problems as Lush did with being able to trace it. A lot of times you are buying these from a third party vendor, you do not buy it directly from the source. So sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get statements from these vendors who have to get it from the supplier and if there's an additional third person. So you're going through a lot of hoops to get this and that sometimes these things just aren't as efficient as they'd hope to be. So I can understand where it would be harder for these smaller companies to adequately trace where their sources are coming from. Plus, if they get this from a third party vendor, that doesn't mean that person is being supplied the mica by the same person. If you ask for a statement of where it's sourced, sometimes that takes a long time for them to get back to you and you could be waiting a very, very long time. Plus, these vendors can get it from a different supplier, maybe their mica supplier isn't the same, also, if you get like mica blended with some sort of pigment into it, then that's a whole nother person because now you have to go through, there's just, there's just a lot of hoops that you have to go through so I can understand where it would be difficult for smaller companies to perhaps find this information out, especially quickly and to reliably be able to find this information out a lot. So I can understand why Lush just decided we're just not going to use this. Being ethical is a very, very big source of their business, so for them it was just easier for them to withdraw. With all this information being said, I would love to know what your thought process is on this, what your opinion is on MICA. If you have more information on this, please feel free to leave some down below. Also on that note, because we are talking about MICA, I will be reviewing the Jaclyn Hill Highlighter Collection. Keep an eye out for that, and with that, I will see you in my next video. Bye!